Hey everybody, welcome to That Jiu Jitsu Podcast. If you're new here, welcome. Why not hit that subscribe button real quick? And if you're not new, thank you again as always for joining us. I'm Justin Lesko, a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu brown belt and a former pro MMA fighter. I'm usually joined by Mike Callahan, also a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu brown belt, and he is also a law enforcement officer. But it's just me today doing another deep dive. Today, we are looking at a very divisive person slash gym slash story. You are either on the I want nothing to do with them side or the I love being part of this team side. There doesn't seem to be a lot of middle ground. Today, we are talking about Team Lloyd Irvin and more specifically the man himself. Some words you will hear a lot today are allegedly so that we don't get sued. And unfortunately, I'll warn you now, you're also going to hear the words rape and sexual assault a lot as well. I am sorry in advance for having to say them so often. I will say ahead of time, I am making no allegations against Lloyd Irvin. I've never even met the man. The goal is not to defame him in any way, but to compile for you readily available public information. I am simply providing you with publicly available knowledge, statements from people associated with this story, and my own opinions based off of said statements and information. I will source everything I can on screen for those watching the video version, and I will put all the sources I use in the description below for both the video and audio versions of this episode. Now, is Lloyd Irvin a good person? Is he a malicious person? Is he or any coach for that matter responsible for the behavior of their students? Is success in sport enough to overlook egregiously awful behavior? Those are questions you're going to have to answer yourselves and I'll for sure give you my opinions along the way. But let's take a look at Team Lloyd Irvin. According to BJJ Heroes, Lloyd Irvin was first introduced to martial arts at just three years old in Taekwondo, but like so many others, seeing Hoist Gracie at UFC 1 piqued his interest in Jiu Jitsu. Allegedly, he received his blue belt in a month and he quickly climbed through the ranks and was promoted to black belt. You can read his full bio on BJJ Heroes. And just a quick side note, for the rest of this episode, anytime I tell you that you can read something at a certain place, just know the link is below. That's just gonna save me from having to say the link is below about a thousand times. Lloyd opened his school in Maryland and he quickly started bringing in students, including some who would go on to be some of the top competitors in the sport. He had guys like JT Torres, Ryan Hall, Keenan Cornelius. And in 2012, Lloyd announced he was going to start a reality show called The Next World Champion. In Lloyd's own words, quote, this will be like Olympic training. People from all over the world, from different teams, training in the same room together at Team Lloyd Irvin headquarters to prepare to go to battle. No stalling, no trying to win on advantage. The only way to win is submission. All athletes will be skilled in gi and no gi. They will be in control of the brackets and the best man that week will win. Each athlete will get great exposure. I'm working on an outlet to get this episode seen by people outside of the BJJ circles to get more exposure to our wonderful art. I am at a point in my life where I really don't care about much. I don't care what people think, what they say. I just want to help people that love BJJ reach their dreams, whether they are on my team or not. I really don't care. So if you love BJJ, let me know it right here. I don't care what people think. Remember that little quote for down the road. You can actually watch these episodes, by the way, on YouTube. They're sort of interesting to watch in hindsight, but make sure you don't watch them until you're done with this video. So at this point, things are going well for Lloyd. He has an affiliate program with other schools. He has high level students. He was even part of Team Dominic Cruz on season 15 of The Ultimate Fighter in 2012. In addition to Dominic Cruz, he has MMA fighters under him like Brandon Vera and Mike Easton. Let's look at some of the ways he built all of this up. 
Lloyd was always known for his aggressive marketing, and one of the strategies he used was sales funnels. It's not super complicated, but without going into too much depth, it's basically a way of luring in your customers. You get their attention and then you direct them to a video or a webinar or an article, which then directs them to the next thing and the next thing and so on and on and on, all the while it's prompting them to pay you for a service or a membership. So you might not sign up right away, but you'll click the link to watch the next free video where you'll again be prompted to sign up. And then the process just repeats and repeats and repeats. If you've ever gotten an email from a company that you gave your email address to, congratulations, you're in their sales funnel. Lloyd actually talked all about this in an interview that you can listen to. In addition to just running the school, Lloyd also ran something called MMA Millionaire Mastermind. He put on seminars aimed at other martial arts gym owners, and it was supposed to be sort of a how-to for sales and memberships. Think Tony Robbins, but for jiu-jitsu. He also sold this class as a DVD instructional. I Definitely cannot show those to you or play audio from them because I'll get sued, but I have seen them. The sales tactics are aggressive, which is fine, I guess. No one says anything about a pushy car salesman. It just sort of comes with the territory. And no one says Lloyd can't branch out for other revenue streams. If you're a good jiu-jitsu instructor, you teach people jiu-jitsu for money. If you're good at getting sales for a school, you for sure can teach people how to do that too. It's very difficult to find anything about these seminars now, and it's even more difficult to find anyone today talking positively about their experiences with them. And I don't think they're a thing anymore, just based on my ability or lack thereof to find information about them. But one former MMA Millionaire member did detail some of his experiences, and again, this is just his opinion that I'm stating for you. His opinion. His. In a story from Bloody Elbow, they shared a letter that he had sent out, and it was Beta Academy owner, and this guy was actually an MBA and a CPA. His name is Nakapan Fungerforn, and I don't know if I said that right at all. And basically, this letter describes him ending his relationship with Lloyd and his time dealing with the man. Quote, I was just another cog in a money-making machine engineered by a man who has no problem manipulating people's trust and adoration as a means of turning a profit. Unfortunately, I was not only naive and trusting, but too focused on the goal of growing my school and the growth of martial arts in general to see that I was being manipulated to earn more money for Lloyd just like everyone else." End quote. Another quote from the same letter, quote, I even won the title of marketer slash implementer of the year at three different MMA millionaire events. I am not pointing this out to boast, but rather to illustrate what a perfect poster boy I was and became for this amoral organization. For this prestigious position, I agreed to pay Lloyd Irvin more than $35,000 a year for business coaching advice, and in exchange, I was granted the privilege of selling information products to his followers. What people don't realize is that under this arrangement, I lost more money than I actually made." End quote. And there's one more quote from this guy, and I know these are long quotes, but just, they're worth it, just trust me. Quote, Bullies attempt to intimidate those whom they perceive to be weak. Bullies make threats. Bullies exploit others to make themselves feel powerful. Lloyd has attempted to intimidate me, even going so far as to bring a gun to a business meeting to encourage my silence and continued cooperation. Lloyd has made what I and many others consider a veiled threat against my wife via Facebook. He uses petty intimidation tactics and threats that are unbecoming of a martial arts instructor. Lloyd Irvin Jr. is a bully. This realization has affirmed my decision to completely disassociate from him and his MMA millionaire cartel." End quote. Are these the words of a disgruntled former business partner? Are they true, false, somewhere in between? I don't know. But again, they are his opinions, and I'm just relaying to you what he said publicly in an attempt to help lay some of the groundwork. Now, fair warning to you, this next part, it's going to get very dark. 
On New Year's Eve 2013, two Lloyd Irvin students, Nicholas Schultz and Matthew Maldonado, were arrested for the brutal, violent rape of a female teammate of theirs. Allegedly, the two men bumped into the woman and offered to drive her to an instructor's home, but instead took her to the St. Matthew's Center parking garage. There, they beat her, and as she went in and out of consciousness, they raped her. Repeatedly. This is a, a hard story to, to tell, and I'm sorry. After they were finished with what they set out to do, they left their victim in the parking garage. The whole ordeal was captured on surveillance cameras, and I will not be showing any of that on screen. Schultz and Maldonado were indicted on 19 felony counts. One of the questions that I asked in the intro was, should an instructor be responsible for their students' behavior? I, I don't think they should. People are responsible for their own behavior, and based on the information currently available to me, I cannot say this attack was Lloyd's fault directly, but my man did some bad shit in the aftermath. In an attempt to distance himself from what was going on, I mean, all of these news stories were going to mention Lloyd. The two rapists knew their victim because they all trained together at Lloyd's school. His name was going to come up. Well, we talked about Lloyd's aggressive marketing and sales already, and he quickly got to work. Lloyd purchased the domain LloydIrvinRape.com. That way, when people googled his name plus the word rape, they had a chance of seeing that site and clicking on it, instead of news articles that talked about the rape of one of his students by two of his other students. And if people clicked on the link that he had purchased, LloydIrvinRape.com, well, then they saw a webpage with information about an upcoming rape prevention seminar that he, Lloyd Irvin, would be hosting. So that's not illegal what he did there. It's just really, really, really shitty. After the backlash against him about this, let's go with offensive decision, he changed the site and it went back to the basic hosting page. Fast forward to today, if you go to LloydIrvinRape.com, you actually get a detailed account of this story, including this next part, which I will warn you again, also gets very dark. As the world became aware of the charges against the two Lloyd Irvin rapists, I mean students, it started to come out that Lloyd himself was charged in a gang rape in 1989 when he was 20 years old. Allegedly, Lloyd was a member of a group of seven men who went out to dinner with a 17-year-old girl and then had a few drinks in an apartment and she was raped repeatedly. Lloyd's defense for this and his testimony included him saying that he did in fact want to rape her but was physically unable to and that having sex with a quote freak was not one of his best ideas of fun but he did not oppose it. Just let that sink in for a minute. Lloyd was acquitted of the rape because he was unable to maintain an erection, but his co-defendant was found guilty. Fast forward back to 2013 and Lloyd was quiet for a few weeks after all of this news came out. The rape by his students of a student, his attempt to bury that news by purchasing the domain, the revelation that he himself was an attempted or would-be rapist if he was physically able to do it. Lloyd eventually addressed some of it in a statement to Gracie Mag. It reads like a PR post, which it is, and Lloyd maintains what he said in court in 1989 is true, that he didn't actually rape the victim. He distanced himself from the two rapist students, saying they didn't train with him that long, and he makes the stand that he is, quote, 100% against rape, end quote. Something most people don't have to specify in their lives, but hey. After the rapes and the revelation about Lloyd's own would-be rape, he started losing students. All of his top guys were seemingly gone overnight. If they were all leaving just because of what had happened, I don't think anyone could fault them. But the information that was coming out was compounding on top of the rapes. Students, well, I guess former students now, started providing insight into the culture at Lloyd School and around Lloyd himself. There was a piece in the Miami Times about Lloyd titled The Cult of Lloyd Irvin. Speaking to the paper, one student recounted, quote, the people he had the most control over were females, end quote, going on to say, quote, any task at any time, they were extremely obedient, end quote. The article also says, quote, Others were disturbed that he would share a hotel room with student Nigel Easton while traveling, 
a habit witnessed by several of Irvin's students, end quote. The article goes on to say, quote, several students allege that Irvin made advances on wives or girlfriends despite being married since 2003 to his wife, Vicky Irvin. Escobar recalls introducing Irvin to his girlfriend at a club then leaving them to talk about a potential business opportunity. He looked back to see Irvin with his arm around her. She walked away telling Escobar that Irvin had invited her to his hotel room, end quote. In fairness, that's just one article with only a few accounts given. But what about Lloyd's more famous students? Both Keenan Cornelius and Ryan Hall issued public statements after they left Lloyd's. Keenan's was on Facebook, but Gracie Mag also shared an article about what he said. Quote, what I believe and feel about these issues is personal and private, but let me make something understood. I would and will never endorse or support wrongdoing, whether it's on the mat or off. And though I've made truly great friends through TLI, have had the best training of my life here and the greatest success, it's time for me to go. I can no longer be absolutely sure that this is the right environment for me under the current and enlightening circumstances, end quote. Kind of a nothing statement, but he obviously felt compelled to acknowledge why he left. In an open letter that was published by Bloody Elbow, I'm quoting Ryan Hall here, quote, Over the past week, certain revelations have come to light about awful subhuman behavior on the part of a number of members of our community, some of whom I know personally, end quote. He continues, quote, I would think that the vast majority of people should agree that their behavior is beyond repulsive, not only its dismissiveness of the suffering of the victims involved in the debacle, but also in their staunch refusal to exercise the analytical portion of their brains and reason for themselves in anything other than a completely self-serving manner, end quote. Basically, I take this to mean he is aware that people are sticking by the team despite what they have done because it is more beneficial than doing the right thing and leaving. Ryan Hall says later in the statement, quote, their reluctance to act speaks volumes about their weak character or their already being under some level of mental control, end quote. That statement from a few minutes ago from the Miami Times piece about Lloyd having control over people seems more and more realistic the more of these I read. Another glimpse into the culture and the people that Lloyd surrounded himself with come from a statement from Lloyd Irvin black belt Phil Proctor. He posted on a forum and then his post was shared by Bloody Elbow. Talking about the original case against Lloyd, quote, The trial from 1990 is news to me. This will sound blunt and maybe offensive, but it sounds like a train was run on a dirty whore that got to feeling guilty. Bad judgment, hell, fuck yes, but not rape. I know this is a touchy subject and I have daughters too, end quote. So that's just a grown man and friend of Lloyd saying that a group of guys in their 20s getting a 17 year old girl drunk and allegedly, do I have to say allegedly if Lloyd publicly stated that what he said in the courtroom is accurate and if people were found guilty? Well, we'll just be safe and keep it in. Allegedly take turns raping her. That was all her fault, obviously. Your mentor says in court and in public that he wanted to have sex with a drunk 17 year old but couldn't because he couldn't maintain an erection and you still defend him. Sounds very cult like to me. Allegedly. Back in 2013, Lloyd ended his affiliate program with a message on Facebook that said, quote, effective immediately, Team Lloyd Irvin affiliate program is terminated. I want to thank every Team Lloyd Irvin affiliate for their loyalty and friendship throughout the years and especially during the last two months. However, there is clearly a lynch mob made up of a handful of people who will settle for nothing other than my head on a stick or me hanging from a tree, end quote. Which, bro. The fact that you don't think people would be upset about the things that you have admitted to in public, not even the things that others have said about you, but your defense in your rape case that it's a mob against you, that, that probably speaks to who you really are. But Lloyd still has his gym, he still has students, he still allegedly charges a ton of money. And this brings me back to some of the questions I asked in the beginning of this episode. Is Lloyd Irvin a good person? I think he is demonstrably not, but that is just my opinion based on the evidence I have seen and the accounts, including those from Lloyd himself, that I have read. Is he a malicious person? You can probably just skip back 15 seconds and repeat the answer I just gave for that last question. 
Is he or any coach for that matter responsible for the behavior of their students? I said a little bit ago and I maintain, no, I don't think so. Lloyd may have created a hostile culture in his school, but those two rapists in that parking lot, they acted on their own accord and via their own free will. They didn't do what they did because their jiu-jitsu coach forced them to or because their school's culture was toxic. Is success in sport enough to overlook egregiously awful behavior? I guess that is up to you to decide for, for yourself. For me, the answer is no. I, I wouldn't train at a Lloyd Irvin school even if I was guaranteed to become a world champion. But there are people who still train under him. There are only two possibilities for a current student. One, they don't know about Lloyd's past or the New Year's Eve rape. Or two, they do know, but it's not enough of a reason for them to train somewhere else. And admittedly, I can't wrap my head around the second one. Even if you don't think what Lloyd did was wrong, which is the wrong way to think, but even if you don't think what he did was wrong, why would you want to be associated with someone who, when you Google him, you can immediately see his reputation within the community? Why would you want to train somewhere that most people seem to want to distance themselves from? There are so many great coaches in the world who haven't admitted that they want to rape a 17 year old if only they were able to. But like I said, I guess that's up to you to decide. I won't say I hope you enjoyed that episode, but I hope you at least found it informative. If you did, please give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. We have a lot of content coming in the next few weeks that you're not going to want to miss. Thank you all for coming with me on this deep dive. I will see you all in the next episode.